Howdy folks, Jamboriki here. Don Bluth movies are renowned for being quite dark and mature for animated kids films. So it's no surprise that many of these villains push the boundaries of how evil cartoon baddies could be. In this video, I'm going to be ranking every Don Bluth villain. A few things before we begin though. One, I won't be counting villains from Don Bluth sequels. This includes Don Bluth's own Bartok the Magnificent, because I'm saving them for another video. Two, I have made many videos about Mr. Bluth's films before, but keep in mind that opinions can dramatically change over time. 3. I know folks wanted me to include Dragon from The Secret of Nim in this list, but honestly, he didn't really give me much to write about. Sorry. With all that being said, let the countdown begin. Mr. Mole from Thumbelina. Mole is one of the many suitors preying on Thumbelina. Don't get me wrong, there was potential here. A rich aristocrat with a hatred of sunlight, a prejudice towards upground creatures, and heightened smelling senses. <laughs> How do you do, Miss Lampolina? Pleased to make our acquaintance. He despises sunlight animals so much that he treats an ancient bird with utter disdain and disregard, which comes off as horribly cruel. Well, there's one less bird to Twitter, Twitter, Twitter up there. So yeah, I could see this guy developing a personal grudge against his surface level rivals, and then maybe going on a digging rampage once he loses against them, using his keen nose to maniacally track everyone down. The villain we get, though never really lives up to his sinister character development and makes for a rather unengaging suitor compared to his competition. Thumbelina? <laughs> she could keep me company and tell me stories, don't you think? I guess that a nonchalant attitude makes sense for someone who lives in excessive wealth because he's privileged enough to treat Thumbelina like another luxury that he can afford. But the last thing I want my antagonist to be is mellow, especially when Mole already has a very promising backstory for a subterranean villain. I went up once, nearly blinded me. Hurried as fast as I could back down where it's dark and decent. If anything, Miss Field Mouse ends up doing a lot of the heavy lifting for his pursuit of Thumbelina. All Mole has to do is turn up for the wedding. Though, it is creepy how he's visibly happy while his bride walks down the aisle of misery. The guy is deluded. I cannot marry Mr. Mole. <gasps> I don't love him. What? In the finale, all the other villains get to go crazy against their rivals or scare Thumbelina herself. But all Mr. Mole can do is scamper after her like he's a dad that's lost his kid at the playground. <laughs> Thumbelina, come back! I really do think that Mr. Mole could have been just as engaging as Thumbelina's other suitors. The ingredients were ready for the stew pot. And I really love his regal posh design. But the movie sadly doesn't really do anything with his potential. Mrs. Toad from Thumbelina. Mrs. Toad is a flamboyant amphibian that wants to turn Thumbelina into a megastar after hearing her beautiful singing voice. She's made very memorable thanks to her extravagant personality and colourful design. It's like she's constantly high on her own music. Underneath all this flair though, is a selfish narcissistic woman. I mean, she dramatically kidnaps Thumbelina in the middle of the night and bizarrely acts like her crime is completely normal. Buenos dias. I hope you sleep very, very good. Huh? Oh, who are you? Nosotros? We are the very happy family singers de España. She cares so little about Thumbelina that she will happily physically hurt her just to get her to show off her pipes. Now I make her sing. <laughs> bueno, muy bueno. She uses her signature musical number to persuade Thumbelina into believing that a humble life has no merit. But fame and riches will grant you all the happiness that you need. A very shallow and unhealthy mindset, of course. I wouldn't say it's an effectively hypnotic song on Thumbelina, but it does illustrate the kind of frivolous woman that Mrs. Toad is, and explains why her kids are so spoiled. We make big monies together. You make mama rich. You are important person. You are famous. Weirdly enough, Mrs. Toad randomly vanishes from the film early on, leaving her smitten son Grundle to take over her role. Which is fine, I guess, because Grundle is a more intimidating villain. But it does kind of make Mrs. Toad's own scheme feel unfinished. Mrs. Toad might disappear a quarter of the way through, but her short time on screen is kind of fun, because she's such a theatrical and vibrant villain. Drake from The Pebble and the Penguin. Drake is a jerky jock who competes against our hero Hubie for the attention of the beautiful Marina. He's in ridiculously great shape for a penguin, so much so that it's actually hilarious. Give him glowing green eyes and a flowing supervillain cape and you have one gloriously theatrical evil bird. To top this campiness off, he's voiced by the always hammy Tim Curry, who really digs his teeth into voicing a super buff and arrogant bad guy. Curry has long held a career in masterfully voicing cartoon villains, and Drake demonstrates why he's become a state of the trope. 
Why, they'll be just like me. <laughs> Drake loves to bully and torment Hubie, always calling him a loser. But maybe this is because he envies Hubie? All Drake has is his big pecs and fancy fashion sense, nothing else. Or while Hubie has charmed Marina by just being his nerdy, sensitive self. So Drake could be jealous of him. Self, nerd. I hear you want to be a big ladies' man. <laughs> Marina frequently declines Drake, but he never actually listens, because he doesn't respect her decision freedom, and he actually feels insulted by all her no's. No? No? Oh, I get it. You're joking. Hank, he even uses penguin lore to intimidate her into considering him, even though said species lore is kind of dumb for community survival. You must choose a mate before the full moon mating ceremony, or... <sighs> Be banished. <laughs> Gosh, that's the law. As over the top as he is though, I did notice a lot of details that helped hype up his menace. Like how he joyfully throws Yubi to the leopard seals. <laughs> or the fact that he's so intimidating that penguin predators are his very own loyal minions. Although, my faithful servants, we have seen that Yubi is a leopard seal meal. <laughs> and he can smash down stone stairs with simple ease. In the finale, Yubi gets a chance to stand up to Drake, proving that he's strong enough to take on his longtime bully. But this fight is unfortunately pretty dang short. After all the rivalry development between these lads and build up for Drake's hyper macho intimidation, we end up with a showdown that sort of comes and goes. Drake is certainly a daunting villain for our hero, but Tim Curry is doing most of the work in terms of personality. He doesn't really get to do much while Yubi is on his adventure except get repeatedly rejected by Marina again and again and again. And boys, his big climax a letdown. Although, his villain song is kind of fun. Don't mess with Drake. Don't make me laugh so hard that you begin to ache. Pinky from Rockadoodle. Pinky is a nightclub owner who gives Chanticleer, a rooster who left his farm after being humiliated, a career as a music star. To Pinky, Chanticleer is his personal cash cow that he can milk as he pleases. But Pinky knows that the rooster could leave if he wanted to. Fortunately for this crooked fox, he's very good at selling the appeal of fame to Chanticleer. Murray, give us a roll. See that? They love you! He's eerily just like a lot of real-life music producers. Scumbags who will happily pamper their clients, but at the end of the day, it's all just love bombing that set manager can use over their client. My Lou Pearlman alarm is ringing! Chanticleer isn't Pinky's only showbiz victim, because he even craftily drags one of his naive dancers, Goldie, into his scheme, creepily manipulating the poor girl by holding a bigger stage roll over her head. Also, he can demeaningly use her as bait for the lonely rooster. Ugh. You promise no one gets hurt? No one gets hurt. You just do the number, make him happy, and keep him away from that bad little kitty. Sure, Goldie ends up falling in love with Chanticleer, but Pinky couldn't have predicted that. However, that's not to say that he can't be a dumbass. You see, when Pinky expands into filmmaking, Chanticleer finally catches on to his boss's intentions. In the scene straight after, he idiotically gives his star a working motorbike for a movie scene and leaves his studio doors wide open during filming. This is honestly one of the stupidest villain moves I've ever seen. <laughs> Stop those birds! Pinky is one of the lesser known Don Blue villains, often overshadowed by Rocket Doodle's more whimsical baddie, who actually turns out to be Pinky's boss. I do think that he's a very authentic take on the exploitative leeches that work in music, but Boise's dumbest moment really, really dumb. King Lord from a troll in Central Park. This royal leader of the trolls is a very different ruler compared to his loud, angry wife, Queen Gnorga. He's very anxious, and he's quite submissive to the far more dominating queen. He almost borders on being her minion, but the stark contrast is kind of funny. They're such opposites that it's amusing. Whenever Gnorga goes ham on being evil, Lord will always wimpily chime in. No, no, my dear, no. That place is too dangerous. Besides, it's green. I would also argue that Lort's more laid-back attitude actually helps the two to work as a villain team. Lort's grounded perspective can help reduce Gnorga's temper and steer his wife into using her head. I know. <laughs> 
quite agree. That's why we truly need the little baby. To bring him here so we can finish him. When Ganorga pitches the idea of turning the rule-breaking Stanley to stone, he acts as the voice of logic by pointing out that a petrifying obsession has dramatically decreased the troll population. But to avoid any backlash, he imaginatively pitches a far worse punishment. I know a place, rock and steel, nothing grows. <laughs> nothing creatures more troll-like than we are. Think of it for him. It will be worse than stone. It will be slow. It will be painful. Yeah, it kind of backfires because Stanley lands on a greener part of Earth, but my point is that he still was able to come up with an idea that pleased his wife while also still being royally strategic. Whatever faults one monarch has, the other balances it out. Gnorga might be impulsive and volatile, but Lord takes things one step at a time. Lord has a cowardly wet blanket, but Gnorga is great at taking the lead. Together, they're like the devil and angel on a villain's shoulders. Lord isn't exactly a great standalone villain, but he is a fun addition to the troll royal family dynamic and a testament to the charm of having villain duos. Miss Field Mouse from Thumbelina. This rodent rescues poor Thumbelina from the winter, only to then take on the job of convincing her to marry the wealthy Mr. Mole. Miss Field Mouse seems like a humble countryside mouse at first, but she gives me the heebie jeebies at the same time. She appears to be kind, yet that compassion doesn't come off 100% sincere. Every time she talks, she sounds like she's phoning in this nice lady act. Thumbelina, tell Mr. Mole a story. Like, after Thumbelina finds out that her love, Prince Cornelius, might be dead, Miss Fieldmouse immediately insists on visiting Mr. Mole, cunningly knowing that Thumbelina's amazing singing is a surefire way to please the mole. When Thumbelina, who needs time to grieve, declines, Miss Fieldmouse has the gall to emotionally manipulate the poor girl. I saved your life this very day and you'd rather not? Very well. Fieldmouse also has this unique relationship with Mr. Mole. It's obvious that she only values him for his immense wealth. You can tell that her baking skills have attracted Mole's interest, and she's now just waiting to reap the benefits. She acts calm and polite around him, but then becomes noticeably ecstatic the instant money enters the equation. I will reward you handsomely. <sighs> oh, I will. I will. This leads to a really catchy song in which Miss Fieldmouse oversells the idea of marrying Mr. Mole while downplaying the importance of love in marriage. Marry the mole. I do not blame Thumbelina for being drawn into this snappy musical number. I mean, in the scene after, Thumbelina actually starts contemplating marrying the mole. So there's a big chance that Fieldmouse's memorable propaganda song made an impact on Thumbelina. Perhaps I should marry the mole. He could take care of me. He could. Fieldmouse might not be as colourful or eccentric as other villains in Thumbelina, but you know what? That's what I kind of like about her. Her villainy has this subdued nuance to it that's weirdly chilling. She kind of reminds me of a cult leader. Grundle Toad. Grundle is yet another predatory man who goes after Thumbelina as a bride, a rock-brained clown who falls for Thumbelina's pretty face after one look, completely ignoring what she wants and the fact that her heart belongs to Prince Cornelius. In his head, she's infatuated with him too. Grundle is a mama's boy through and through, and it's his mum's pampering that makes him feel entitled to Thumbelina. Mum, you'll give her to me if I marry her. Very well. You can marry la niña. He takes his pride very seriously too. The idea of losing Thumbelina to the prince he envies could bruise his very fragile ego, and he becomes an erupting volcano whenever he's told that he's losing this competition of his. I hear that she loves the fairy prince, right? I crush fairy prince! He's certainly the strongest of Thumbelina's suitors, something he uses to his advantage, whether he's scaring kids into helping him find the prince, or stealing Berkeley Beetle's wings to force him into working for him. Why don't you just go home and marry a toad? You ever think about that? You find yourself a pretty toad with warts and you marry her. However, he's also the least smart suitor, do. He's not quite right in the head and maybe missing a few brain cells. Although, his childlike density is kind of unsettling in a way, because he doesn't think about what he's doing, and it does not take much for him to get violent. <laughs> Come on, show me what you got. <laughs> oh, and as dim as he is, he's at least intelligent enough to listen to his far, far more clever partner, Berkeley Beetle. Almost like he ends up using the Beetle's brain to fill his own empty skull. No, the brain. And set up a trap. No, 
The prince. Yes, Ned the prince and set up a trap. Do you speak English? Grundle might not be my favorite Fumbelina villain, but he does bring a lot to the table as a deranged clown ravished with jealousy who serves as the most intimidating suitor for Fumbelina. Berkeley Beetle from Fumbelina. Berkeley is a sly bug who tries to exploit innocent Fumbelina. He's a well-dressed insect with a lot of swagger for a beetle. His cane adds to his fancy fashion, but he also uses it as a weapon of command over others. The way he treats Fumbelina is quite creepy. Right away, he's grossly handsy and gropy with her on first sight. Perhaps you'd prefer this. Oh, Mr. Beetle! <laughs> I don't even know you! Then, after groveling at her beauty, he decides to market her as an insect at his nightclub. Almost like his compliments were all phony. Heck, once Fumbelina is outed as a human, and the audience mocks her for not meeting bug booty standards, Berkeley immediately abandons her without any remorse. I'm sorry, Toots! I guess you're too... <laughs> He drains her stardom dry so, so fast. Then again, that's the sleazy side of showbiz for ya. The film could have just forgotten about his character after this. But interestingly enough, his role dramatically shifts, and he becomes an unwilling servant to the bigger, stronger Grundle Toad, acting as the cunning brains to Grundle's thick-headed brawn. Why don't you just nab this prince, and you set up a trap for the girl? It's kind of fun seeing his power go down a peg, because it exposes how weak he really is behind his cocky glamour. All that slick arrogance crumbles into dust the instant he has to compete against his very own predators. Oh, are you out of your mind? I'm not going down there. You know what that guy does to beetles? Do you have any idea what he does? He stuffs them. He stuffs them and he pins them on his walls. Let's all be frank, though. It's the one and only Gilbert Gottfried that really sells this villain. Gilbert's trademark boisterous voice and dark sense of humor are exactly what gives Berkeley most of his charisma. <laughs> Hiya, Dutch! Beetle's my name and Razzmatazz is my game. Berkeley Beetle might be a brittle little insect, but his style, confidence, and smarts make up for his weakness. Queen Ganorga from a troll in Central Park. This wretched queen of the trolls has sent the kind-hearted Stanley to New York as a punishment for illegally growing flowers. I think the appeal of Ganorga comes down to how much she adores being evil. It's like she was baked in hell itself, because all her passions and joys are rooted in all things gross and despicable. For example, she gets creepily excited over children's cries. <coughs> She even uses her powers to curse the little boy into flooding tears, only for said flood to potentially drown the kid? Imagine the trauma she's given him. She's also a very dominating force in the kingdom. Her personality is far, far, far more commanding than her submissive husband's, which is very alarming because she's horrible, compassionless, and unpredictable. You moron! <laughs> Punishment isn't supposed to be nice. It's supposed to be punishing. <laughs> Her angry impulsiveness does help her to remain committed as a villain. The instant she learns that Stanley's punishment isn't working, she doesn't just sit around and complain. She's a very I'll do it myself kind of girl. I'll go there myself and finish that happy little mutant. The destruction and chaos she causes across Central Park is kind of wild. She turns a beloved New York landmark where people go to relax into a dystopian wasteland, a dark ominous place where Stanley's friends Gus and Rosie are all alone and vulnerable. Gotcha. <laughs> it's this finale that lets Gnorga go all out with her magic, showing how powerful she really is. Her she even uses her very own breath to casually blow down a building. That's kind of badass. This climax also gives us a silly but very fun magic fum jewel. A battle between Stanley's organic green versus Ganorga's cold hard stone. With Stanley's flower power actually being worthy against his queen's intensely strong magic. Even after she loses, she uses the fact that she transformed Gus into a troll to cruelly force the boy into turning Stanley to stone for her. This kid has gone through enough as it is. And now he's being made to petrify his best friend. Luckily, in a sting of irony, Gnorga is defeated by being turned into flowers. Yep, the very thing she despises, and unfairly banned from the Troll Kingdom. 
I can't think of a better villain comeuppance for her. A troll in Central Park has often been criticised for being too safe and light-hearted for a Don Bluth movie. While there is a little bit of validity to that complaint, re-watching the movie for this video made me realise that it's much darker than I remember, and that's mainly thanks to how wickedly malevolent Gnorka is. Is she maybe a bit too overpowered? Hmm, perhaps, but she's still a great example of how entertaining a 100% evil villain can really be. The Grand Duke of Owls from Rockadoodle. This pompous, rock and roll hating evil bird wishes to create eternal darkness. So he tricks Chanticleer the rooster into quitting raising the sun. However, a plucky little boy called Edmund, who the Duke turns into a kitten, vows to convince Chanticleer to come home. There's a malicious selfishness to an owl who seeks eternal darkness for his own benefits. He doesn't care about how his tampering with daylight will affect other animals or the natural order. He just wants to create a utopia for our kind. We creatures of the night have worked very hard to make absolutely sure that that bird does not return. While not as scary as another owl character of Bluth's, He's still frighteningly larger than all the farm animals, and even towers over Chanticleer. Oh, and he expands in size even more in the finale, transforming into a huge stormy tornado, the kind of dark chaotic weather the Chanticleer is supposed to block from the sunshine. I really love how Bluth adds texture to this classy villain's personal life. When he's not tormenting our heroes, we see him doing casual things, like playing his majestic organ while singing his woes, or casually baking in his villain lair. Colourful details like this really help to flesh him out as a character and make him more than just a mean bird. I'll admit that his minions are pretty dim-witted, but it's all for kids' comedy. Plus, he is good at motivating his henchmen into sympathising with his regime. Destroy the farm, destroy the cat, the dog, or do you want the chicken back? No, we hate the sun. The answer's no. And he is not shy about threatening his own nephew to get stuff done. Them or you. While he does spend a lot of the film making orders from his lair, he is allowed chances to boastfully indulge in his newfound power over his prey. With Chanticleer gone, and the Grand Duke now in his element, these poor creatures are greatly unmatched for survival. Uh, please, uh, pass the pork. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, to me. Yeah. <laughs> excellent, gentlemen, excellent. The Grand Duke of Owls is basically the boogeyman in bird form, the kind of ominous figure of darkness the kids can imagine seeing through their window at night. A symbol of evil that only light and hope can defeat. Preed from Titan AE. Preed is the first mate on the mission to Titan, who later betrays his crew to make money from Titan and to plead a bargain with the villainous Dredge. While Preed is on our hero side at first, there's already something a little off about him. Sure, he's happy to give a tour to newcomer Kale, but he makes for a very sarcastic host. Plus, he even inappropriately flirts with his crewmates. Why, you positively glow with maternal warmth, Akima. It's very fetching. I must have you. In your dreams. When he's supposed to be on watch duty during a scene, he's way more distracted by a fun game of shooting harmless animals, which shows that he does get a kick out of overpowering creatures and killing them. The fact he doesn't take his watch duty seriously also clues in on the possibility that he's not scared of the dredge enemy. Because of a certain deal, there's all these other little details that can make us skeptical. Like when our heroes have to sneak into somewhere, Creed boastfully says this. This requires cunning and deception. And he has a bit too much fun being his captain's abusive slave master. So it comes at no surprise that this freaky weirdo is actually all in it for the money and isn't shy about his eagerness to threaten lives to steal said profit. Out of the two twist villains in Titan AE, Preed owns his villainy the most, really sinking his teeth into being unapologetically evil, even going as far as to attempt to murder the most lovable characters on the ship, which, oh boy, made me mad. Is Goon right there with you? Yeah. Then please tell him goodbye for me, won't you? <laughs> what? <laughs> Pre does end up betraying his own co-conspirator, Corso. Which, honestly, yeah, that was a cocky move. Because Corso is an ex-military man, and unsurprisingly, he knocks out the traitor once crossed. Preed could have had a skilled crime partner in Corso. The combat muscles, 
after his foxy cunning. But Preed's weakness was his very own greed. I really love Nathan Lane's voice for Preed too. Nathan is best known for voicing the quippy comic relief Timon in The Lion King, but he can voice villains when cast in the part. His trademark sarcasm and neurotic delivery lend really well to slimy roles. But it wasn't just the money the dredge were offering. It was the health plan that came with it. They'd let me live, provided I kill all of you before they get here. Look, Preed is not a sophisticated twist villain, but his line between dodgy weirdo and loyal crewmate is fine enough to keep us guessing which side he's really on, and then eventually buy his betrayal once it rolls around. The Dredge from Titan AE. The Dredge are a legion of aliens who once destroyed the entire planet of Earth and are now determined to stop a band of humans from finding the Titan, a lost library that holds the only hope of creating a new Earth. These space monsters are a mysterious race of creatures that can't be reasoned with. Their designs are so abstract and minimalist that you can't really read their emotions. Oh, and when they talk, their voices sound so eerie. It's like someone added Vocaloid to a swarm of wasps. <laughs> The fact they've been animated with early CGI actually works in their favour, because this uncanny valleyness adds to their horror. Their three-dimensional presence spookily sticks out, like they're from a completely different universe altogether from our hand-drawn characters. Their one goal in existence is to wipe out humanity, out of fear of what the human race could do to them, and that panic drives their relentless need to destroy. These aliens are so traumatizing to behold that one night, one of our heroes has a full-on nightmare about them. <laughs> they remind me of the Faroon from Warwind, a strategy game that I grew up with that kind of scared me as a kid. The Faroon honored those who met rebellion with ruthless destruction. True. The threat is also backed up by an advanced level of technology that's beyond human understanding, and each dredge is armed with a powerful laser blaster that they love firing at humans. Although, as cool as their gadgets are, Kale does manage to escape one of their prison cells like it's a tent with a stuck zip. Despite being one-track minded, they do try to coerce two of our supposed heroes into a deal to be their insiders in trade for profit and safety. However, they don't exactly commit to said deals, because their need to destroy Titan overpowers any bargaining strategy. How dare you try to cut me out like that? <laughs> what makes them truly imposing, though, is how they're basically anthro-shaped pure energy. They're not a vulnerable fleshy species. They're stacks of lightning, leaving us to wonder how on earth humanity can even beat them which forces our heroes to creatively and scientifically think outside the box to beat their oppressors. If I can reroute the system to use dredge energy, that would start the reactor. The energy relays are linked to these circuit breakers, so this should do it. Joseph Corso from Titan AE. Corso is an ex-military man who captains Valkyrie, the ship destined for Titan. He seems to have his heart in the mission at first, but then we find out that he only sees Titan as a high stop. Before his big bad guy reveal, there aren't really any good clues for his villainy, but his twist still makes sense on any rewatch of Titan AE. He does a good job at overselling himself as this noble soldier who cares deeply about saving Earth, and he uses that optimistic passion as well as his history with Kale's dad, to incentivize Kale, who holds the genetically passed on map to Titan. And I would want to do that because... Because it's worth it. Because the human race needs you. Maybe you haven't had a look around lately, but there aren't many of us left. However, Kale is not low-hanging fruit, because Corso has to break through Kale's cynicism. There's a challenge here for our manipulating villain. Well... Having your planet blown up can have that effect on a species, but maybe I've been wrong all these years and it took your inspiring speech to make me see it. As the movie goes on, we can see Kale treating Corso like a new father figure. It's rather ambiguous in hindsight whether Joseph has genuinely been endeared by Kale or if he's just trying to keep his map keeper close. That's the fun of it all though. We can read Corso's actions being based on either caring about Kale's safety or looking out for the map. His ticket to fortune. <laughs> Once the cat is out of the bag, Corso goes full military leader. He's been trained with intense combat skills and to prioritize his action missions over his own feelings, which makes him an authoritative and brutally violent villain to reckon with. <laughs> uh -uh -uh. 
That being said, when Kale gives Corso the how could you stare, you can tell that it slightly cracks Corso's hard wall. So there is a chance that Joseph's bond with Kale was maybe a little real. After Corso loses Kale in the finale, you'd think he'd go into panic mode. But he actually tries to stay calm and cleverly executes a stalking method. We're going to follow them. His army background really does help him as a villain in so many ways. I would say that Corsa represents the loss of hope that humanity feels after losing Earth. The universe has ostracized humans and made their lives difficult. All humanity can do is survive and adapt in a galaxy not made for them, and dauntingly oppressed by godlike genocidal aliens. While Corso isn't justified in getting rich off of Titan, we do understand his pessimism regarding Earth's rebirth. Yeah, what is the truth? That the human race is out of gas. It's circling the drain. It's finished. The only thing that matters is grabbing what you can before somebody else beats you to it. Now, yes, Corso does change his mind later on and ends up joining our heroes to save Titan. While I can't find it in myself to completely forgive him, I do respect that he at least knows what he almost did was pretty dang bad. You can let go, kid. I wouldn't blame you. No! I'm not gonna let go! And there is sort of some selflessness to his sacrifice for Titan's safety. Go on. Get out of here. Kale, where are you? Go. It's better this way. Joseph Corso may be the least sci-fi fantastical of the three Titan AE villains, but he is the most compelling and best developed. A once proud and loyal soldier of Earth, corrupted by the harshness of space. Jenna from The Secret of Nim. Jenna is a rat of the thorn bush who insists that the rats stay where they are while everyone else wants to move away to somewhere safer. This creep doesn't feel any concern for his fellow rats. He just wants his aggressive military ideology to be validated and is willing to wage war on humans at the cost of rat lives. Then destroy us on the spot. I agree. He's right. We'll be killed. Not if we got them first. He means war. While he does have obvious villain vibes, from his flamboyant cape to his malicious scowl, he can do a good job at playing the decent gentleman character in front of our hero, Mrs. Brisby. Forgive the ill temper of my colleague. It would be an honor to assist Jonathan's widow in any way. Also that he can divert any suspicion away from him while he plots to assassinate their leader, Nicodemus. Of course, this can't be a simple murder because he has a reputation to defend. He cleverly and sneakily weaves the murder into Mrs. Brisby's house move, which the rats happen to be helping with. What if we're discovered? Ah, listen, the Brisby house is a large cement block. In the moving, what if it should fall? Although Nicodemus' death still ends up being pretty gruesome. What I find fascinating too, is how Jenna's henchman isn't 100% on board with this murder. Hey, Jenna even mocks this henchman for having the audacity to be shocked by his assassination idea. It's like he thinks it's normal to desire committing treasonous rat slaughter. Jenna, you can't kill Nicodemus. No taste for blood, huh? <laughs> They've taken the animal out of you. I also despise how he reacts with misogyny to the sweet, loving Mrs. Brisby when she warns the rats about human danger, gaslighting her as crazy, even though she's looking out for his life too, just because he's stubbornly determined to stay put in this bloody bush. Don't listen. She's hysterical. Get out now. Ah! You get out. However, it's his panic desperation to violently silence Mrs. Brisby and try and steal her magical stone that outs him as a murder suspect, which excitingly means that he can stop playing the nice guy and finally embrace his evil madness without apology, all while he proves himself to be an impressively skilled sword fighter against the rat's very own captain of the guards. <laughs> Amusingly, it's Jenna's own henchman that actually ends up killing him by the end. Yep, the same guy he condescended as weak finds the guts to play hero in the finale. Oh, the deliciousness. Carface from All Dogs Go to Heaven. When Charlie the Dog escapes the pound, his casino co-partner, Carface, ends up killing him off. However, Charlie refuses to stay in heaven and zips straight back to Earth. Then, he returns to the casino to steal a little girl who can talk to animals so that he can win at betting games, which infuriates Carface. Carface is one of Don Bluth's much darker villains, a chain-smoking and sharp-grinning mobster with a gravelly voice played unnervingly straight by character actor Vic Tabak. Where's the girl? Ah, uh, I... I don't know. 
I think you do. Let's give Carface credit first. He really dedicates himself to pretending to be a caring friend to Charlie before offing him off later. When he suggests the business split, he picks his words carefully and flexes his acting chops. So it seems like the breakup is out of compassion. We need to split up the partnership. What? Are you out of your mind? I'm gonna be looking for you, Charlie, and what's the first place they're gonna look? Uh, here! Then, he gets the naive Charlie drunk to make him even less suspicious and way more vulnerable. Only for Carface to murder our Charlie boy in a pretty shocking way for a G-rated movie. Can't keep a good dog down! It only gets worse from here though. For the rest of the film, he continues to be a real monster. This guy's morals are so putrid that we have no idea what boundary he'll cross next. The way he treats Anne-Marie is particularly disturbing. Sure, Charlie is no prize parent either, but Carface keeps her enslaved in his casino basement with no freedom. Mr. Carface, you said I could go outside today. And then later, Kate is a rope in an abandoned dock while she's very, very ill. Even Carface's own henchman faces wrath. You see, Carface keeps his own pet piranhas. So, if a minion disappoints him, then they can bet that they'll become chow for these snapping fish. Want <laughs> something done right, you gotta do it yourself. Let's be frank though, All Dogs Go to Heaven is a pretty dang weird movie, so Carface does have these silly moments. Like when he's pretending to ride a car to feel like a human gangster or firing a cartoony laser gun at Charlie in public during broad daylight. Not to mention, it is kind of funny that despite all of his menacing intimidation, it's a campy singing gator that kills him off by the end. <laughs> despite this though, Clarface is still a very dangerous dog and one of Don Bluth's most chilling creations. Rasputin from Anastasia. After Rasputin the evil sorcerer is banished from the Romanov palace, he vows revenge by selling his soul to the dark arts so that he can put a curse on this royal family. While trying to escape, Princess Anastasia bangs her head and develops memory loss. Years later, an adult Anya ventures off to find her origins, or while a bitter Rasputin tries to kill her off to complete his curse. Okay, so Rasputin does spend most of the film in his underworld cave. However, there's something very funny about this one-way villain hero rivalry to me. While Anya is trying to live her life to the full and finding out who she is, she lives rent free inside the head of an obsessive rotting old man who childishly let one party disinvite spiral him into self-pity. That's why I'm stuck here in limbo. My curse is unfulfilled. Oh. Rasputin also does more than just feel sorry for himself in his lair. He has the dark arts granted to him at his helm, and he uses his twisted magic to assassinate Anastasia. These murder attempts are not only kind of shocking, but also super creative uses of Raph's evil magic. Rasputin always acknowledges where Anya currently is and works out the best way to kill her in that environment. He knows his limitations while off the grid, but embraces them with his sordid flavor of magic. Yes. Jump! Hiromanov. Yes. No. Oh. When Rasputin isn't obsessing over Anastasia's murder, he's been consolidated by his unlikely cute bad minion, Bartok, a rodent who generally cares about his master and tries to give him healthy life advice. Sir, I'm begging you, please, please forget the girl and get a life. He's less of the cliche sniffling suck up and more like a hero sidekick who got stuck with this miserable sod. These scenes with Bartok also inspire some incredibly imaginative character animation from the undead Rasputin. Don Bluth has a whale of a time playing around with this villain's stretchy, decomposing corpse, giving us some terrifically macabre gallows humor. You know, sir, really, you should watch your blood pressure. My nephew Izzy just keeled over one day, mid-mango. Stress, it's a killer, sir. As sulky as Rasputin is, it only takes two failed murders to make him quickly realize that he can't win from a long distance. So he hops off to Paris to slay in person, amusingly treating the trip like a fancy holiday for himself. Time to go. But you're dead! You're falling apart, sir! Now, sure, by this point in the movie, Anastasia has found out exactly who she is, but her arc isn't over yet. She's still repressing the very childhood trauma that ruined her life in the first place, and Rasputin's return represents a physical manifestation of that PTSD. The film's climax gives Anya the chance to conquer the dark cloud of her past, now armed with courage and love from her adventure. I'm not 
afraid of you. I can fix that. It's especially satisfying watching the princess boldly and fiercely stamp on Rasputin's only source of magic, exposing him for the pathetic sellout sorcerer that he is. Oh, 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 one more thing. Rasputin also happens to have the best villain song of any Don Bluth movie ever. This cinematic rock opera style musical number that fits perfectly for a Nosferatu baddie, self secluded in his own hellish underworld. Rasputin is a fan favourite for a reason. He can be a very funny comedic campy baddie who chews the scenery, but he can also pose as a serious horror level threat as a zombie sorcerer. Hence why he's made my top 5. Warranty Rat from an American Tale. This shady rodent is the very worst of the worst. From tricking immigrant children into becoming workshop slaves. <clears throat> this is Whittier. Papa! <laughs> <laughs> blackmailing mouse kind into paying for safety against cats. Just throw down all your money and that kid. And I will personally convince these cats to leave you alone. Oh, and guess what? He's actually a cat in disguise. Boo! There's something truly icky and disgusting about this villain. He has to be Blue's most hateable antagonist, made all the more grotesque by the fact that he's inspired by real New York underground loan sharks. There's admittedly some wit to his disguise though. He knows that he's small for a cat, but instead of letting that get to him, he turns it into a money-making scheme. What's the bottle? Uh, so far, we have woo, uh, collected $89 and up uh, and 13 cents. Uh, oh, <laughs> and we'll get another 17 from both. When said alter ego is seen by Fievel, he looks genuinely upset because of how much commitment he's put into hiding it. Hence why he's so, 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 so quick and fast to capture the kid before the truth gets out. Gentlemen, <sighs> cat's out of the bag. Get me that mouse! He also desperately wants to be seen as cultured by his fellow cats. Whether he's playing the violin like an amateur, or quoting Shakespeare like a pretentious hipster. It's hard to see him as classy though, when he's such a slimeball. Music be the food of love. Play on, Macduff, play on. I don't know which is worse, the music or the Shakespeare. When I say that he's sensitive about his disguise being exposed, I mean it. Once the mice out Warren, in his pajamas mind you, the nasty cat gets spiteful revenge by setting fire to the mice's hideout while cackling like a whack job. This guy's the lowest of the low, I hate, 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 hate him. <laughs> Now sure, once Warren and his cronies are scared out of New York, he makes it very clear that he's just going to move his crime scheme to Hong Kong, which you could argue makes for a rather cynical conclusion. However, the harsh reality of con artist culture is that's exactly what real scammers do when they fail. They just go to another community. So we should always be careful of trusting people like him and to be suspicious of their activity history. Don't worry, there are plenty of mice in Hong Kong. Oh my, I'll have to learn to calculate in Chinese. Mm -hmm. Before I reveal my number one pick, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more fun film and animation related content. Thank you folks. Sharp Tooth from the Land Before Time. This beastly Tyrannosaurus Rex is the very dinosaur who causes the death of young Littlefoot's mother. Let's not beat around the bush. Sharp Tooth is one of the scariest kids movie villains to date. <laughs> With his hellish red eyes, bared razor teeth, and massive humongous scale. He's not just visually imposing though. He's got one great snout for sniffing out his prey. He's shockingly fast for a T-Rex, and he's so strong that he can smash through hard rock. At first, we think that the earthquake caused him to fall to his death, but then when Sarah finds him later on, she wakes him up, and we spend the rest of the film knowing that he's on the prowl. These kids already facing very dangerous prehistoric obstacles, and now we have to fear them becoming Sharptooth's dinner. Don Bluth hypes Sharptooth up as this titan of a dinosaur who can return from a fall that should have killed him. Yet the film doesn't leap at the chums to make him completely invincible. The kids, who are greatly outmatched, impress us with their precociousness when they point out Sharptooth's Achilles heel. Look, we'll coax him to the deep end of the pond. He can't swim with those scrawny arms. It's quite inspiring seeing these children without any adult's help working together as a team to take down their greatest predator and the killer of Littlefoot's mother, going against all expectations to achieve what should be impossible. Sarah! You're back! 
Sharptooth to me is the Don Blue villain, a terrifying giant dino who defied science and struck nightmares into millennial kids. What a legend. <laughs> If you enjoyed this video, then please check out my other villain rankings. I've been Jamboriki, cheerio folks.